Welcome to EMO Lacrosse, where we talk everything field lacrosse. Before I get into the rankings, I do want to touch up on one thing. There's a little bit of drama going on between the players and the PLL and the World Championships. I'm going to cover that tomorrow because I want more information to come out before I make a video on it. We just need more information. It's a very, very difficult topic, and and there's nobody in the right or the wrong here. I just think it's difficult when there are World Championships going on during the Premier Lacrosse League season. So we're going to wait to see what happens, who plays this week, who doesn't. Put that all on standby. Let's get right into the Week 3 rankings. Number 8, I have the Cannons. The Cannons' defense is the glaring weakness, allowing 30 goals and 15 goals per game through two games, both the league worst. Obviously, Week 2 was a vast improvement from Week 1, losing in overtime. They're starting to find an identity, but they're still searching for that first win. The signing of Cade Van Raphorst for the defense needs to have an instant impact for the Cannons because this defense just is not it. Number seven, the 0-2 Whip Snakes. That sounds weird to say, but this is all I'm going to say. Do not press the panic button for the Whip Snakes. I know what the record says, but it is a long season, and the Whips have one of the most talented rosters in the league with one of the best coaching staffs in the PLL. Jim Snagnita will turn things around. I'm not really worried about the Whip Snakes. Maybe it just takes them some time to get that first win, but I'm not worried. Number six, the Water Dogs. Offensively, this team is too hot and too cold at times. When things are humming, it feels like they can dominate. They can get six goals in the first quarters against a good Redwoods team. But when things aren't going well, it's not so great. It's getting three goals in the next three quarters. They'll need to go back to the drawing board after a close win versus the Chaos in week one and a Chaos team that was handcuffed because of a lot of players playing in the NLL championship. And then a very disappointing loss against the Redwoods, a team where you were up 6-0 and it just felt like you had no bite in the second quarter or even the second half. It just felt like it was all Redwoods after that first quarter. So a lot to look forward to from the wet, wet water dogs, excuse me, and how they respond to this. Number five, I have the Chrome. The Chrome were unable to play their aggressive, fast-paced offensive style against the Archers, and well, they did not get that offense going. Much of that should be attributed to the Archers' defense and midfielders' playing defense, as well as Brett Dobson's ability to stop the ball. Part of that was also that Sean Scannoni didn't play his best game, and much of the Chrome's identity revolves around an aggressive clearing game, playing that fast-paced offense, it requires clean saves with quick clears and outlet passes. That's just not what they got. The Chrome never got that going. Jackson Morrill went off with five goals, but he was the only thing working offensively for the Chrome. And even Jackson Morrill said that this offense is not going to be at its best when he has to dodge to score. He said he'd like to have more assist, and I tend to agree they need some work after that disappointing loss. Number four, the Chaos. First game back with the Buffalo Bandits players equals a win for the Chaos. Dane Smith was also out for this game because he got engaged after winning an NLL championship, so congrats to him. I still want to see this team at full strength because Dane Smith is an electric player that they could really use. They played extremely well, though, without a full roster. Now let's talk about the guys who did come back. Josh Byrne, Chris Cloutier, and Chase Frazier. They all made a massive difference for the Chaos after they did not play in Week 1. And I'd be willing to bet that if the Chaos had these guys in Week 1, they would have beaten the Water Dogs and they would be 2-0, and and people would be talking about them a little bit differently. When you put everything together with Blaze and his outstanding defense and outstanding historical game, this team will be a problem in the future. Number three, the Atlas. The Atlas earned their first ever win against the Whip Snakes in PLL history, and this offense is elite. It all starts with Jeff Teat, 
who leads the league in points with 10. Words can't describe how talented he is when you pair him up, especially with Xander Dixon, Eric Law, and the heroic game-winning Chris Gray, who might have not played his best game, but he stepped up when it was most important. The sky's the limit for this attack group. The midfield group also showed up big time and is strong. This, to me, might be up there with the Archers as one of the best all-round offenses in the league. The defense looked much better, and we're starting to see how the two new shiny first-rounders step up, and Jack and Cannon had a much better game, 13 saves at 56%. Number two, the Redwoods. Talk about a team who struggled early in this game, down 6-0 in the first quarter, but the Redwoods rallied back. And the real story is the switch defensively to long pull Garrett Eppel on Michael Sowers. So Michael Sowers was kind of torching this offense early on. They made the switch, and it absolutely paid off because, well, the Redwoods stifled the Water Dogs after a disastrous first quarter. The attack line for the Redwoods is amazing. It's very, very fun to watch with Pinnell and Garnsey. How about his stick skill? And then West Berg has been a really nice touch. Cole Curse breaking out for the midfield unit is huge because with Charlie Bertrand still injured and doubtful, they really need somebody to step up on this midfield unit. And when Bertrand is back to full health, this unit should elevate as a whole. Number one, it should be to nobody's surprise, the Archers. So far, the Archers are the undisputed number one team in the PLL, and even without Grant Ament, the Archers were able to earn a huge win over the Chrome. This team is very, very good. Tom Schreiber is an assist machine, and his ability to keep his head up has really looked nice and makes some massive, massive plays. The offensive firepower and creativity is there. Like I said, this is probably my favorite offense in the league, up there with the Atlas in terms of most creativity and all around. You get a lot of production from the midfield and the attack players. Now the missing piece has been filled, though, and that's Mike Sisselberger. Uh, The face-off position was the looming problem from last season, and Sisselberger has been more than just a band-aid. He's been downright incredible at this position as a rookie. Also, Brett Dobson is an elite piece to this defense. He makes the light the the defense light years better. His ability to make some game-changing saves puts him up there in best goalies in the PLL currently and He only makes the Archers so much better. So these are my rankings. Let me know what you agree or disagree with down below. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like, subscribe, and comment if you love field lacrosse.